my name is Mark Tannenbaum. Uh, I'm one of the product managers at Unity Analytics, and I'm going to talk with my colleague and friend Mark Choi about two new features that we are uh, putting out for you. And these, we're very excited about these, and we hope that by the end of this session you will be as well. The mere fact you're here first thing at Unite to listen to it at least gives me some cause for hope. So thank you for coming. Um, so, insights to actions. What do we mean? The whole point of analytics, in our opinion, is it has nothing to do with data, it has a something to do with questions, and it has a little more to do with answers, but it really has to do with the fundamental point of analytics is to enable you to take actions, to do things to improve your games, right? I mean, why get the data? Why learn if you're not going to do something with it? So the two new features that we're putting out are fundamentally about this concept of insights to actions. And if you, who here was at the keynote last night or saw it one way or another? Okay. One or two of you seem to have slept through it, but otherwise, mostly, I think you made it. Uh, Mark Choi spoke about these two features, and he did mention in uh, the video lead-in about this notion of insights to actions, which is something we're thinking a lot about. How do we make it easy for you to do the things that are necessary to make a better game, right? So the first feature, and the one that I'm going to address, is called standard events. Um, the point of standard events is basically, I have a game. My friend Christoph here has a game. Not quite yet. Wait, wait your turn. <laughs> you have a game. You have a game. Let's assume for a moment we all have levels in our game. I think it's a pretty common concept. We probably have tutorials. We probably have, <laughs> maybe we have a store if we're using in-app purchasing. And we're all, today, okay. instrumenting differently. Right? We put in our custom events, and our custom events, maybe, uh, maybe Christoph says level done, maybe I say level over, somebody else says just level, and that's okay, you can get your data that way, but number one, you may miss things. There are things that you will forget to do uh, because it didn't occur to you on this occasion to do them. Um, number two, if you have multiple titles and each one of them is just sort of done haphazardly, it becomes very difficult to make sense between your games and get insights that you can use across your library of games. So what we want to do is we want to create some order out of this chaos. And there's a lot of good reasons for creating this order, some of which are, I hope are obvious just from that setup, but others of which we'll dig into as we go here. So fundamentally, what we're talking about is making your game more fun. My, uh, my marketing guy is standing over there and he wants me to talk about fun. He doesn't want to talk me to talk about analytics or any of that. He's like, fun, tell them it's fun. And, and it is about fun, and the reason it's about fun is that, as I say, ultimately this is about getting actions to make your games better. How do you make your games better? You make them more fun. If your games are fun, they're engaging, people will come back, you'll get higher retention rates, you'll get more money, you'll get whatever it is you're trying to get out of your game will come from making your game more fun. So what we've done is we've broken down these standard events into these five categories that are all about player experience. What makes your game fun? So, application, which is to say, your game as an application, just the generic, hey, what, are people finding the screens they need to get to? Progression, are they getting through the game? The onboarding experience, right? Are they getting through your tutorials and getting into the game? Engagement, things like social mechanics, the things that increase sticky factor or K factor that bring them back. Um, and then finally, monetization. I don't think that needs too much explanation. You, uh, if, if you are doing this as a profession, you need to be able to make money. And so improving in each of these areas and adding these standard events, and I will show you in very practical terms what this means in a minute, um, but improving each of these uh, will help you get the answers you need in order to take the actions that will make a better game. So I want to get a little more specific. Just a few examples. There are 34 currently standard events. We may add to this list, but the, the, beta, the open beta that we've released, 34 events. Here are some examples in each area, just so you can get a picture of it. Um, so for application, things like screen visits. Are people finding the screens of your game? Seems like a reasonable thing you'd want to know. Your, your game may be hard, challenging. You, probably your, app, your UI shouldn't be. Like, it shouldn't be a challenge for people to find the settings screen, right? Um, progression, 
it's kind of obvious, my level starts, my level completes, the things that progress the player through the game. For onboarding, tutorials come to mind. I'll actually, in my practical example, I'll show you something that might not be as, as obvious as a tutorial. Um, engagement, things like user sign up, uh, social shares, or the other side of that, which is the accept of a social share, from which you can calculate a K factor, uh, uh, how viral is your game. Uh, and then monetization, things like ad and IP tracking. And indeed, in-game monetization as well, which is to say your game economy and tracking that. Okay, so with that, uh, I would like to get out of the realms of the arbitrary and abstract and into something a little more concrete. So I'm going to invite uh, my friend Christoph Mary to come up and join me. Um, Christoph, could you please just, uh, why don't we start by introducing yourself and Maxim? Yeah, hi. So uh, I'm Christoph. I'm from the studio FrozenBots. There are five of us. I'm the only dev working on the team, so there's a lot to do. And uh, we've made this game, so it's a 2D platformer with uh, 3D characters. We're very fond of the 90s period for the platformers, Mega Drive, Super NES, etc. So we love those hard plat platformers, and we wanted to recreate that experience for uh, mobile games. Come on. There so go. there are about 70 levels in the game. Uh, you can choose characters that have uh, specific gameplays. So there's one with jetpack, one with uh, double jump, etc. And uh, yeah, it looks kind of like the old school platformers. Cool. Thanks, Christoph. So, um, so here it is. I just, you know, I brought it up just so you can sort of see. It's, uh, and I'm terror. I will tell you, I'm awful at this game. Uh, I was trying it on the phone, and I'm just, yeah, no, I'm, I'm pretty hopeless. But that's, that's not unusual for me. I don't, I, I've, I've been a game dev, but I've never been a great game player. Um, all right. So, uh, what I'm going to do is I want to show you guys very practically how standard events fits into uh, Maxim, and like how you would go about implementing it yourself. The whole point of this is that it should be really easy. Um, rather than you, maybe you think you release your game, you haven't put in any events, or you release your game with some events, but you don't know which events they should be, or you sit around a table for three days uh, thinking, like, what do we need to instrument? What are the questions we want to ask? Like, none of, what we've done is we've, we've looked at the data, looked at our own database, seen all the events that everyone's been sending us. We've added to this some of our own, own innate knowledge because we've got a lot of game developers uh, at Unity. Sh shocking, I know, but we do. Uh, and built this curated list that allows you, and I'm just going to go to code now and show you. So right here, is that visible enough? I'm going to zoom in just so you can see this. Right here is an ad start event. OK, so if you all are familiar with the way analytics has worked, Unity Analytics has worked up at this point, it would be, uh, you know, you'd say analytics.custom event, and then you'd give it some arbitrary name. And by the way, we're not going to take that capability away from you and still do arbitrary stuff, because your game will have things that are totally unique. But if your game has ads in it and you want to track your ad starts, you want to track your ad completes, or something that Unity Ads doesn't do today, which is track ad offers, like how often did somebody how often did you offer them the opportunity to see a rewarded ad? Maybe you want to compare that to the number of times the ad actually showed, which was requested by the user, right? That's a, a measure of the effectiveness of that placement. So rather than you needing to figure this out for yourself, we give you a list. And let me show you how this looks in code. I'm just going to create another event here for a second. OK, so all these things. You can use this as a checklist and just go down the list and say, OK, does my game have cutscenes? If so, maybe I should be tracking my cutscene starts and my cutscene skips. Does my game have IEP? Well, there's some IEP related stuff here. Uh, if I have a level progression, like you can see how this works. It's all designed to make the implementation. We have people in our group. How, Chris, how long did it take for you guys to implement? You guys put in well, quite a lot of these events. How long I did it take? I put in almost every one of them, and it took me about half an hour. Uh, okay. The code was ready. I just had to put them uh, in the right places. Right. And the, well, the nice thing about it, it's I don't know anything about uh, analytics. And uh, actually, the problem was I didn't know what what questions to ask myself 
what should I measure? Right. And uh, well, that list actually is uh, self-explanatory. Cool. So, uh, thank you. I mean, that's very much to the point. Is rather than spending days trying to figure out what to implement, and I'm not saying you won't have your own custom things that need to be implemented that we can't predict, but everybody who's got a level system should be tracking level complete. I don't, I don't think that's even a question. Level starts, level completes. It's just, you should do that. And then you can answer questions about how, fa uh, how far and how fast your players are progressing. Simple. So we've given you this list. It just makes your life super easy. Now, I want to show you some details about these events. Um, so here's, this is where, uh, Christoph, where you guys put in ad start. And what we've done is we've made this. Actually, I probably shouldn't have deleted that line. Let me just add this in. I want to show it. So let's look at the ad start. Whoops, start. And so it's all a strongly typed API, right? You've got method signatures, and we tell you not just the events that you should have, but the relevant parameters. There's different signatures for different forms of some of these. And importantly, and you can see where Christoph has done this at the end, you still have room at the, at the back side of this for your own custom parameters. So let's say you get to the end of a level, and I've told you all I need from you to know is the, the ID of the level. But you want to know for your own purposes how many rubies were left, how many hit points were left, uh, something like that. That's unique to your game. You can still send those with the standard event. Okay? So it gives you both the structure and the flexibility. All right? So I want to show you one more thing that we've done here. So, uh, just so, so this is how you do it in code. And, and anybody, how many people here have done custom events with Union Analytics? OK, a fair few of you. It's all, they're all at the front. Is there something about the people in the back? You come in, oh, I've never done a custom event. I'm going to sit to the back of the audience. <laughs> it's like, it's like uh, in school, they don't want to be called on you. Have you done a custom event? <laughs> OK, so a bunch of people here have, a bunch of people haven't. But the way you know, that you um, uh, uh, would think about a custom event, uh, what we're you know, saying is we're going to make this, I'm, actually, I've lost my train of thought. I apologize. Um, we're going to do a custom event. And, uh, and with the standard events, we now make this much easier, much faster. You don't have to think about it. We've got you know, all these things set up. But you'd all have done it in code. Regardless of how else you've done it, you'd have done it in code. We've, we're introducing something with, with, the custom, with the standard event package that is new that you haven't been able to do before. So let me show you this. We've got a play button here. If I can select it. Yeah. Still not there? Come on, work with me. There we go, play button. OK, and I'm going to do something that, Christoph, you didn't do in the game. Nope. And then I, but I told you to, and you did it in code, so I've commented it out. So <laughs> he did the right thing after we, we talked it through a little. So first interaction. I mentioned to you during my earlier slides, I want to show you something about tutorial or about onboarding flow that doesn't involve tutorials. Your first screen, right? Your game pops up. What's the churn rate on your first screen? Do people open your game and then not play the game? Now, you might think, well, why would anybody? It happens a lot. We, and, and our data scientist, one of our, our main data scientists, pointed this out to me. He said, we need an event that tracks this. So let me show you how I do that. So I've got this button. I'm going to add a component. And I have this new analytics event tracker. Boom. And the analytics event tracker, let me make this a little smaller. OK, the analytics event tracker is a, is a component. It can be done completely codelessly. So for example, a designer on the team, doesn't have to be the developer. Uh, but anybody who can get into Unity can do this work. And that's useful, because sometimes it's not really the engineer who cares about the analytics. It might be a BD person. It might be a game designer, level designer. So maybe it's suitable at your studio to do this yourself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to wire this button up with a standard event. So the first thing I want to do is click UI to say it's going to react to the UI. I have a button with some on-click events already happening. I'm just going to add one. Um, I should have had my hierarchy maybe over here for the moment. And I'll just drop my play button into here. And did I, oh, what did I do wrong here? Oh, because I pulled the wrong thing. That's why. OK. Analytics event tracker, trigger event. Button now wired to event. Simple. The thing I haven't done yet is told, told the event what to send. So, Check it out. All the standard events are wired into this, including the ability to do a custom event. Right? So always uh, happy to let you do that. And then we go to onboarding, first interaction. And I can give it a name like I could say play, or I could make it dynamic. Boom. 
and now it's wired up. So just, it's just a component like any other component in Unity. If you want to do your analytics this way, it keeps it out of the code, so you can let your game designer say, do this. If you don't trust them in your code, I'm not saying game designers can't be trusted. OK, I, I am kind of saying that. But you get the idea. So, uh, so I just want to show you, like, we have, we have two ways to do this. I can do it through a button. I can do it through life if we wanted to. I can do it through uh, mono behavior lifecycle events. Uh, I can set it up on a timer so that it's literally checking every now and again. And, and I'm not going to get into this right now because it's a little too complex for this, uh, the time I've got. But um, you can actually set up a bunch of rules. And if I set up rules, I'll just give you the gist of this, is basically I can say if a certain set of logical conditions are met, then the event goes. And you can kind of begin to imagine some of the things you could do with that. Anyway, I'm going to turn this off, go back to UI, and I want to just move on to some actual, like the practicals of the data. OK, so here's stuff. Uh, we had you wire up some events. And I have, I've actually got a local downloaded copy, because internet, right? of your stuff on our dashboard. And this here is your level progression funnel. Yep. So let's talk about that. We discussed this yesterday. So let's talk a little bit about what you see in this. Well, we've Actually, got a, a big drop off after the first level. So well, it's not what we want. OK. So you said so that you, were made, you designed this game to be on the harder yeah. side of things. So and you, you may have gotten what you wished for. Uh, <laughs> that might be true. <laughs> but it is a problem, right? I mean, in the sense yeah. that here we are. Sorry, I want to zoom back in on that a bit so we can see. Uh, by the way, for those of you who've looked at our funnels before and think, this doesn't look like their funnels, uh, that's true. This is what will be coming out in a few weeks, uh, where this is, this is local, my development version. Uh, so we have some, you can see it's a cleaned up UI and some new features available. Uh, yeah, so, okay, so you're, uh, you're losing about half your players on level one. And I will tell yeah. you, actually, I did tell you yesterday, that we, um, I had trouble with your level one. Uh, okay. And so, so, yep. what is, so, so, so now that you know that, <laughs> that's a, like, what, what might you do? Yep. Well, that's the beauty of this. Actually, it points out what we didn't see before. So now, now that we know it, we'll probably tweak, either tweak the levels or make some introductional levels before to get the player comfortable with the controls right. and the gameplay. OK, yeah. yeah. So that's the idea, right? This is gives, just gave Christoph an idea about what actions he can take out of the insights that are pretty much automated through standard events. Let me, um, let's look at one other funnel. Now, I'm going to apologize. My dev environment has been running very slow, so let's see how long it takes to get this data here. Uh, we may have to talk over this for a few minutes. Uh, okay. This is all local, so I have no excuse for why it runs so slow, but it just <laughs> is. So we'll let the spinning pizza wheel of death take its toll for a moment. Um, okay. the, uh, so, so what we showed was level progression. This is going to be about ads. Yeah. And I mean, you know what so, the data looks like, because we've discussed it. Why don't you yeah. talk a little bit while we're waiting for this to well, show up? The way we present rewarded ads in our game so far is uh, when you die after a checkpoint, you have the possibility to watch an ad to restart at the checkpoint. So uh, we actually well, don't have that many people that choose that option. So, well, we'll yeah. see the data I, after. I, I, but I the, hope we'll see the data. The, the thing is, it got us thinking about, well, is that the right thing to do? Right. Should we at all ask the player to watch an ad to be rewarded with the right. possibility to play? Or maybe have interstitials now and then coming up? Uh, right. uh, OK, I might, I might give up on waiting for this data, because this is taking ridiculously long. Um, oh, well. <sighs> morning morning uh, uh, event was, OK, uh, on my local host and all. OK, cool. Let's not wait for the data. Christoph, thank you very much. I appreciate it. No uh, hey, everybody, a little round of applause for Christoph. <laughs> and then you, you can throw rotten tomatoes at me for this, because I, I have nobody to blame for this but myself. Um, OK, I want to, if I can make this happen, I want to do one more thing. We'll see if this is going to go, because this is really slow. So as I say, this is a redesigned version of Funnels. And I want, there's two uh, features that I want to mention to you that are coming out of standard events. Uh, one is the ability to automate funnels. So it will be possible for certain types of funnels with standard events to be made automatic. So you won't even have to build them. You'll just go to your dashboard. Uh, we are still toying with whether we want an approval step. 
Ah, there we go. Okay. Uh, whether we want an approval step, but either which way, you wouldn't have to build, say, a level progression funnel or an ads funnel because it'll just happen automatically from the standard events. Okay, so what I wanted to show you here very quickly, because I am a little over time, is, oops, I want to show you another thing that we're doing with standard events which, and, and this redesign, which is really pretty cool. Um, okay, I have just created the world's simplest funnel. First interaction, you saw me implement that event a moment ago, and then the first level start. I'm going to activate validation. And now a lot of people have complained that with, uh, with our funnel system, you create your funnel, you wait a long time, and then eventually, someday, your funnel data appears. Uh, that's not a great cir cir uh, circumstance. So what we've set up now, get this thing out of my way, is a way to validate your funnel in real time. So again, internet problems. So let's, I'm I feel like I'm on a high wire act right here. <laughs> let's see if it works. OK. So, I'm going to move this to a side, and I'm going to hit the play button and watch that first interaction. Remember, I wired the first interaction a moment ago. And please show me the number. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> oh, I'm so sad. Let me see if the, the start works. Oh, my poor data. OK, well. Oh, oh, there it is. We got my front level start. Maybe I, maybe I messed up on setting up. Anyway, so let's say for sake of argument, I made a mistake when I implemented my first interaction. Now I know instantly. OK, I turned that failure into a success. Thank you very much. But you saw that, right, that the level start appeared instantly here, and, or almost instantly, a few seconds delay. And that way, when you're building a funnel, you can imagine, especially a complex funnel, you'd be able to like, just test all the events right here and see the work. And by the way, that will work with standard events, but it'll also work with regular events. I'm going to wrap up because I'm way over time here. So um, let me just, I want to just say, so OK. So just to recap, the whole point of this is to take the insights and turn them into actions. And in order to get to those actions, I would like to invite my friend and colleague, Mark Choi, up to talk about a new feature that we're bringing out that really gets to the heart of the idea of being able to take action. So Mark, could you please uh, join me up here? Sounds great. Well, thank you, Mark. Um, that was uh, really a good overview of standard events. Um, so what I wanted to take some time to do today is go over a new feature that we're coming out with, uh, with Unit Analytics. Uh, a lot of you guys might have heard me speak about it yesterday. And it's something that we're calling remote settings. And what remote settings is, uh, is really bringing some actionability, uh, you know, giving you guys some tools to be able to dynamically control and change your game uh, in essentially real time, right? So, you know, remote settings, you know, you can do a lot of, a lot of different things with remote settings, um, and you can control, you know, basically almost any aspect of your game. Um, it's really an important component of the live ops piece. Uh, really, you know, once you publish your game uh, and it goes live, you know, players have downloaded your game, um, you know, it really gives you guys an opportunity to kind of make some tweaks make some changes if that's something that interests you, right? So traditionally, what has been the problem today, um, you know, with the traditional game development and build cycle, a lot of times if you're making changes to the game itself, you know, what you have to do is, you know, anytime you want to make an update, you have, you have to go back, open up a new build, or, you know, update your build, wait a couple of weeks uh, for your developers or engineers to get through it, uh, make the changes in code, create a new build, publish it to the App Store, uh, and then the worst part about it is that you also have to wait for your players to actually download the latest version of your game uh, to see the latest changes. And so with remote settings, you know, what we're really trying to provide uh, Unity game developers is a cloud-based service uh, integrated with Unity Analytics. And what it provides you is a collection of keys and values that you can use uh, that can be fetched from the cloud um, at the next session start, right? And you can use remote settings to control behavior, the visual appearance of the game, uh, or even the configuration of the game itself. Right? So it's a feature of the Unity Analytics service. Um, and you know, if you're concerned that you know, some of your levels might be too difficult, um, or you want to change the number of bosses that appear, you can even change text inside the game itself or UI components of the game. Um, basically, you know, any type of variables. And what we allow you to pass in today is simple variables like integers, floats, strings, or booleans. 
uh, but we're also working as we continue to develop this feature uh, to allow you to pass in you know, more dynamic assets later on down the road as well too. After you make changes to remote settings, what happens is those, sa those changes get saved to our config server. And then at next session start, um, when a player plays a game, those, that configuration will get pulled down. Uh, our definition of a session start uh, is if the app happens to go into the background uh, for at least 30 minutes. Uh, so one thing about, or one limitation for remote settings today uh, is that you, know, you will have to wait for the, you know, for the, for the player to actually you know, force quit or wait 30 minutes between sessions before they can get the latest configuration. We are adding an API uh, in the next couple of weeks uh, to the engine uh, for you to force update the configuration, fi the configuration file. So you can use this functionality in the future to you know, force the game to actually pull down the latest configuration. Uh, but, that, but that's not, you know, that's not ready just yet. It's going to be something that comes out in the next couple of weeks. So it's pretty easy to get started uh, with remote settings. Uh, like I said before, you need to have Unity services and Unity analytics both turned on. And I'll go ahead and show you how that works in just a moment here. Um, actually, why don't I go ahead and do that now? So if I go into open up a new project with Unity, so why don't we just go ahead and call this Unite Europe. And for those of you who haven't used Unity Analytics before, it's really easy to get started and set up. Um, we have a toggle right here that you can turn it on. Let's say it's turned off. I'll just go ahead and create a project. Oh. You're not connected. Or you're not. Let's see. Okay, there we go. Great. So I'll call this Hello Unite Europe. So like I said before, um, if you wanted to turn on analytics here at the uh, Create Project screen, you can do that here. But let's say I just had this turned off. So what I'll do then is actually open this up now. Hopefully it creates. Seem to be having a little bit of trouble actually opening up a new project. Let me see what might be going on here. Sorry, guys. Okay, I don't know what's going on. So let me just skip over that part. Um, but you can, you know, we, we provide some components inside the actual editor itself for you to pull down the remote settings from the dashboard um, and use those settings, those keys and values that you designate in the dashboard itself and to use it from the editor. You can also use a com uh, UI component that we also provide. Oh, here we go. Now it's happening. So let me just show you now that this is open. Let's see here if I can get this to work. I'm going to try turning on my. OK, great. So I have a blank project right here. And so the first thing that I'll do is turn on analytics. I can just do that by going here into the services window. And hopefully, the internet connection will cooperate with me. <laughs> It's being finicky. Yeah, I have a hardline connection in here, but I don't know why it's not working. Let me try it one more time. Let's try this again. I'll hit reload. Let's go. OK. Last resort. I'll try the Wi Fi. If this doesn't work, then we'll see. Then we'll just go ahead and continue on. OK, there we go. So just select my organization, Mark and Choi. I'll create a new project. Great, OK, finally. So I have this open now. 
<laughs> Normally, it, it, it does, it, I, it, I don't have so much trouble like this. <laughs> this is quite a, right. But, okay. There we go, here we go. It's not showing the entire window, here we go. So I click analytics right here. It'll load analytics up for me, and what I can do now is enable Unity Analytics from the screen. I'll click a couple of buttons, and that's it. You're done with the integration itself. And if you go into the asset store, which doesn't seem to be up as well too, but I'll hit reload to see if this will cooperate with me. We provide remote settings as a package that you can download uh, from the asset store itself, and what that provides you uh, is a set of UI tools that you can use uh, inside the editor. Uh, you can pull down remote settings from the dashboard uh, and then also use it to attach different keys uh, using the uh, add component feature as well. But let me, I'm having a lot of trouble here. So, I mean, I'm gonna, you know, it, remote settings, it's gonna be hard for me to, you know, what I really wanted to show you guys today is actually remote settings in action. Um, and because it depends on an internet connection, to pull, the, pull down these changes, I might not be able to show you exactly what it is that I can do. But let me go ahead and just go into an actual project itself. So here, you know, we have the folks from Dr. Panda. This is a game studio in China. And they've actually gone through the trouble of uh, being an early customer of remote settings. And so the, they've uh, added in uh, a couple of keys that control the theme of this particular game. And so I have this particular scene up here already queued up. What they've done is, as you can see here, they have a Halloween theme so that, you know, in case they have a special event or a special holiday, they can change the actual look and feel of this game for their particular users. What they've also been able to do is, you know, they've added assets into this game that will present or show a Christmas theme. Now, normally what I would do is actually go to the dashboard itself. This is their remote settings dashboard. And so this is a dashboard that comes with Unity Analytics. And what they've done here is set up a couple of different keys around difficulty level, JSON data. You know, they can control the number of Panda characters inside the game itself too. What I want to point out here is that right now, the Halloween value is being passed through as a string value in remote settings. And if I were to change this to Christmas instead, hit save. Now clicking on the sync button right here will allow you to post those changes to the server. I can try to do it, no promises, without the internet working. But you know, hitting the sync button will post those changes to the server. And once it's had a chance to save, the next time I press play in this game, what I would expect to see is a Christmas assets loaded up uh, into this particular scene. I don't think, yeah, see, here we go. So without internet, I'm not able to do that. But just imagine I hit play again in the scene, <laughs> and you see Christmas trees and a reindeer popping up. And that's what you would normally see. Um, a couple of other things that I did want to point out in this particular screen is that uh, one new feature that we came out with uh, just the other week is for you to provide the ability for the game developer to designate different release and development builds or configurations. The development build is, uh, you know, anytime you're playing from the editor, editor itself, or if you use the development build flag in build settings, so if you go here and click on development build, then any, you know, build to the device will pull down the development version of the configuration. So this is one way that you guys can actually QA and test different configurations before pushing your settings to all of your players um, and so that you, know, you, can, you can make sure that things are working and things are looking like you expect. <clears throat> Great. Right here, you can also select the, you know, the, the type of the remote settings value, it's, you know, the key itself as well too. And then finally, you know, in this particular game, they've done something interesting. Let me, sh let me just go ahead and open up this other scene here. So this is a a scene that they built, it's a level, level builder screen. And what they've done with remote settings, well, you know, this is what happens today when you hit play. Ah, oh, see, it's not. Oh, there we go. So as you can see here, what this, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> a lot of trouble today. 
So what you can see here in this particular screen is that this level is being built uh, dynamically by parsing uh, the string value of a, you know, that's being passed through with remote settings, right? And so what I can do, or what these guys have done is, you know, be, you know, using remote settings, if I just reload this page, just to make sure I have the latest version, let's again cross our fingers and see if this will work. If I, you know, I have, I have this, you know, long text of, you know, of a value here, and what this is basically passing through is instructions for the game to parse, and it, it'll actually build a different level layout based on, you know, the values that we pass through. And so if I can get this to work, normally what I would do is I would just paste this in here. And so, you know, If this was actually working, what you would be able to see here is this level actually changing, you know, the different tiles and components moving around, even completely different new art assets being pulled in that's already saved as part of the gameplay, and you could see a completely different level. Uh, players would actually see a completely different level. Okay, so I'm, I'm thoroughly giving up on, on, all <laughs> on what's going on. So I mean, you know, Dr. Panda really did some creative things with remote settings. Um, they've been, uh, you know, they've been building some really engaging, uh, you know, kid-directed games uh, for their players, and you know, we really wanted to, you know, make sure that we, you know, send our appreciation to them. Let me just talk, you know, in the last couple of minutes that I do have left, some of the new features that are coming up around remote settings. Um, so this is something that's currently in development right now. Uh, what we are doing at the moment is Providing you guys, you know, there's a release build and there's a development build. We are abstracting that away and adding our analytic segmentation capabilities on top of remote settings so that basically you guys can create different configurations for different groups or segments of users using the segmentation logic that already exists in Unity Analytics. So here, we've, you know, this, this is designs that we are currently working on, uh, but I just want to go ahead and run through it real quick. You'll be able to create new segments based on our segmentation logic. So in this case, you know, creating something around you know, geography or different events, including custom events. You can even select from existing you know, custom segments or standard segments that already exist in your dashboard. And then what you'll be able to do is actually go to the remote settings dashboard and designate different uh, values for the different segments that you've created. And in this way, you can really start to customize unique experiences for different groups, groups of players inside of your game. So as, as you can see here for this bonus character, you know, all users will see Rainbow Bird. But if we had created this segment, China Level 10 Plus segment, you know, these players, based on you know, our understanding of who they are, if they happen to fall into, into the segment, will see Chinese Dragon instead. Segments are based by keys, and so, you know, if for rewards or for seasonal theme, I could create completely different segments with different corresponding values to target, and then we will do the hard work in terms of actually parsing through the segmentation logic and our understanding of who players are to deliver the right configurations for them. So that's about it. You know, I just wanted to make sure I left some time for questions, but these are our two new features that we're coming out with in, at Unity Analytics, um, standard events and remote settings. And you know, like, like we always like to say, it's multi-platform. You know, it's built specifically for games for you guys to use. And of course, we're always working hard to make sure that we are providing you know, effective UI components inside the editor so that it really makes it easy to get started. So with that, you know, I can invite Mark back up to the stage and we'd be more than happy to take some questions. <laughs> Any questions from the crowd? So we do, so, so version, so you're asking about versioning. Yeah. So we, we are working on version control or versioning so that you can actually look at previous, uh, previous, you know, previous configurations that you built before mm -hmm. and actually have that history going back in time. Uh, so that's gonna be coming out with part of this, you know, segmented 
uh, remote settings feature, you know, feature release as well too, probably in the next couple of weeks. I believe, oh, do I have sound? Do I have sound? Okay. Uh, oh yeah, now I hear myself. Uh, I believe Josh is also working on a diff, a diffing tool right. for that, so right. that you can, as your as your remote settings get more complex, there would be a, an ability to do diffing, so you could see what your changes were. Uh, are you planning to add some experiments uh, features, A/B testing, and such of your remote uh, feature? Uh, it, a very acute question. As you can probably imagine, you know, once we have segmented remote settings in place. We will start to tie that back. You know, it will be tied back to our analytics reporting, so you can actually track the different effectiveness of different configurations. And then you can imagine it's only then a logical step to start providing A/B testing features as well too. So that's going to be something. You know, I didn't want to talk about it, or just I didn't want to specifically call it out because it's still you know further down the line. But around Q4 of this year, later this year, around the, you know you know the fall winter time, you know, hopefully we'll have an MVP or an early beta, you know, around A-B testing, you know, ready for you guys to use. Um, can you talk a little about the uh, data pipeline after the event has been kind of triggered by the user? So I was looking at uh, some of the limitations, like there's a 31-day export and so on. How easy it, is it to hook up, um, you know, connectors to other visualizations and so on? So are you thinking when you, uh, so, so you're asking about taking, bring the data down, uh, and then being able to hook it up to like third-party tools? Yeah. Okay, so we have a, uh, a raw data uh, access for pro users, and so you can uh, download that data. It comes down in a TSV or, uh, or CSV format, I think are the two that we offer, and uh, from there, you can e-tail it into uh, the tool of your choice. So it could, be, could go into anything that way. Uh, that, uh, that is useful, it's, but it's raw, which means, of course, you lose things like our segmentation capability. Uh, but I actually would point you to a man by the name of Mark Cook uh, from a company called Shiny Shoe, and they have made a third-party tool for ETLing our raw data to SQL-based databases and similar. So uh, that's actually a really useful third-party tool to look at. All right. I see a question back. For the remote setting stuff, uh, my customers play my game online and they play my game offline as well with no internet connection. So does remote settings have a way to cache the last settings that you read so that if you don't have an internet connection, your game will still run and it doesn't right. have to have an always on situation? Right, so, so yes, definitely. If you happen to lose internet connection or if there's no internet connectivity available, it'll use the last, you know, last saved values uh, from the latest configuration that happens to be cached on the device. Um, you, we also make sure that you guys, you know, we encourage you guys because, you know, that the, the handler loads these remote settings kind of asynchronously, and so depending on how quickly, you know, the latest configuration files get pulled, you know, we always encourage you guys to make sure that either you guys have default values in place, um, so that you know they see at least something, right? But yes, I mean, regardless, there's always going to be cache values that will be used if there's no internet connectivity in place. Thank you. So uh, we are, we're planning actually to make a game that's for the mobile, but it's also probably going to be ported to the consoles. Is there any plan to support PlayStation or Xbox in the future? So we have, so, so we don't, I mean, you know, that's a good question, you know. New Data Analytics doesn't support the consoles today. Um, we have ongoing conversations with the folks at Microsoft and at Sony. Um, they are interested and open to working with us to get Analytics uh, available, you know, in their environments. Okay. It's yeah. something that we are, you know, continuing conversations with. I know it, it does get asked, and 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 it is something that we are, you know, you know, encouraging them to open up to us. So hopefully, hopefully soon. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we have time for one last question. Uh, maybe up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. uh, either way, I'm yeah. sorry. You guys, look, you guys can always come and talk to us after. So, uh, but either. So I guess you're you're up here now. So. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm not the analytics guy or whatever. I'm more of a game designer, level designer. Yeah. So what I was wondering, how can we use uh, most of the stuff that I've seen was for single player games. Can we uh, use those analytics as well for multiplayer games and uh, uh, use we, that for tracking? Yeah, so certainly. 
I mean, you can use it for multiplayer games. The models you're dealing with get more compli complex, of course, as you add multiplayers and the differences of that. Uh, the standard events are mostly optimized around a sort of first per or a single player mobile experience. Uh, we are thinking now about what we want to do around other areas like multiplayer or VR and what kind of events you'd need for that. So as we go forward, and if you want to contact me, we'd love to get your input because that's always useful. Uh, but, uh, and, you know, but remote settings certainly would work in a, in a, in a multiplayer setting. And, could, and once the segmentation stuff is in place, you'd be able to even conceivably figure out ways to, to do interesting remote setting things that way. So there be, could be some interesting ways to approach that. All right? Okay. All right. Well, thank you uh, very much. Thank you for your patience. Uh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs>